Today's daf we're going to be learning is Gitin, daf Lamed Hey. Um, it's very, very interesting daf. Um, we're going to start with some background information about, um, about women collecting their kachupas. So we have some basic rules that we need to know. Number one, anytime anyone collects from orphans, they have to swear. They have to take an oath. Otherwise, we're concerned that maybe they already received money during the lifetime of the, of the you know, when the father of these orphans was still alive and nobody really knows, right? The father's not there to say so. So everybody needs to take an oath. Now you might say, why does a widow need to take an oath? Because what's ketubah? Let's just go through again what a ketubah is. Ketubah is a promise to the woman. Again, it has other things as well. But in the event of death or divorce, first of all, it commits that the husband will pay from the husband's estate. She'll be able to get food to sustain her. Okay, for X amount of time, we'll talk about what that is exactly. And it also promises her a lump sum of 200 zoos if she's a if she's a virgin when she gets married, 100 if not. Won't get into that whole thing. That was all in the beginning of two boat. And it, the, often there's a tosefet, there's some addition. Okay, but now the way it works is most women, if they are widowed, what will they do? They'll take their miso note okay, monthly payments, and they won't claim their ketuba money because better for them to get food supplements that will continue a monthly fee, let's say a monthly amount forever until, right, until she collects her ketuba. So once she collects her ketuba, she can't get Mizono anymore. So she'll push off collecting the ketuba unless she's in desperate need of a huge sum of money. She'd rather get these small incremental payments, which will obviously add up to more than the ketuba if it continues for a long time than the kesef, than the money of the ketubah. So generally, a woman will not collect her ketubah money until, now, until when? Until she has to. Now, what does she has to? Well, if there's a whole machloket, and we're going to see one of the opinions in today's sugya, a machloket that we saw in ketubah about at what point could she no longer claim mizona? Okay, is it when, basically, it's all different opinions, but they all reflect kind of when she's cutting herself off from the family of the husband. The idea is that if, this is all, by the way, for widows. Divorcees, it's different because divorcees are already cut off from the house of the father. But widows are connected to the house of the father, the husband, until they start either putting on makeup and trying to go get married to somebody else. That's the that's the most strict opinion that by that, at that point, you can't already get Mizono. Or later point, right? You're already married. That's the other extreme. Okay. You're married to someone. Well, that's it. You know, you can't get your Mizono payment anymore. Or we're going to see Shmuel's opinion today. Once you go to collect your tuba in court, that's an indication that you're cutting yourself off because you're saying, I want this lump sum. I don't want my payments anymore. Just by saying you want to get your tuba payment is enough to cut you off from Mizono. Some people say, once you get your tuba payment, okay, there's all different options. Here. There's a range. So that's some background information you need to understand. And the other thing you need to know is that generally a, a ketubah is called a masa bacon. We've learned this in ketubah a number of times that even if a husband doesn't write a ketubah for his wife, the wife is entitled to the ketubah payment. Okay, again, in the event of divorce or death of the husband. Could be she won't ever get it because it could be she'll predecease him. But chances are she's going to get her ketubah money at some point because of that. The husband often sets aside money for her. We saw it in Ketubah, what is called Sarare, Sar, Sar, I forget how to say it, Sarare Kaspe, something like that. He, he binds together money for her. And sometimes he might even give her some of that money during his lifetime because it's it's money with her name on it. Okay, Sarare Atpase, that's the phrase. Sarare Atpase means he basically puts aside money. Okay, Sarare is a, is a bundle of money. So, because of that, there is a concern that maybe she got some of the money, okay? She could have either gotten it before he died, or theoretically, she could have taken from the estate. If you think about it, she's managing the estate possibly once he's dead. So she could have taken some of the money also. And that's why we're nervous that maybe she's lying, okay? But we don't normally think people lie for no reason. So we're going to talk about why exactly she's suffering. So what we saw yesterday is that since a widow cannot collect her money other than by taking an oath, because no one can take food, uh, no one can claim any money from orphans without taking an oath, and she's no different than anyone else. So they got into a problem when at a certain point they decided that women are not, these widows are not allowed to take oaths. 
They were concerned about lying. We'll talk about why. And then Rabban Gamaliel comes in and says, well, we need to have a way that women can get their ketubah money. So why don't we say they could take a vow, even though normally a vow wouldn't have been allowed, but in this case, they could take a vow. At the end of today's sugya, we're going to get to, well, if she takes a vow, theoretically, if she's remarried, her husband can nullify the vow. If she's she goes to a hakam, he can undo the vow. So how does a vow really help? That's going to be the end of today's class. But we have a lot of interesting things before we even get to that. So now the Gemara starts asking a question. Yes, the orphans could be her children. They're not, they're not necessarily her children, though. Either way, it doesn't really matter, okay? My area almana. So let's go back to the Gemara's question. Why does it specifically say almana? Afilu kule almanami. It's a bit of a strange question. But what the Gemara is saying is, why does the Gemara say this statement? Ain amana nifram nichseyitomim elevichvua. When really the line should be, no one can collect from orphans without, without uh, taking an oath. Now, it makes a lot of sense why they're talking about a widow, because our topic is a widow, and we don't really care. We're not talking here about orphans. Our topic is the widow. And it makes a lot of sense that they specifically said the widow, but it's possible the Gemara just wants to teach us this next line, and that's why they asked this question. So, because we know that Habali So why are they specifically highlighting the Almanah? Everybody needs to take a note, to which they answer, Almanah You need to specifically say Almanah, why? You might have thought that maybe for an almana, because of pain, we're going to talk about what this pain grace is, maybe the rabbis were lenient and would permit widows to get their ketuba money even without taking an oath. In other words, everyone who collects from orphans, any creditors, needs to take an oath except for the widow. That's why our mission needs to tell us that it's not true. Also, widows need to. Don't think that. And what might you have thought? What's the china? So there's two opinions. And this term, Mishum china, comes up a lot in our Masechet and also in Ketubot and other places. And every time Rashi and Tosman have a really interesting debate about it. So Rashi says, we want to make sure, the first Rashi on the page, that the men will find favor in the eyes of the women in order, Lina Selahem, in order that the women get married. We need to make it easier for them. The whole ketubah is a promise. You'll be protected. So maybe if they know they have to take an oath, nobody likes to take oaths. So it was a thing then. Okay, we'll talk about this today, right? Oaths are very scary. People don't like to take oaths. If they know the only way they're going to get their ketubah money is by an oath, they'll say this marriage doesn't protect me and they won't get married. Now, the problem with Rashi is this goes against all the Gemaras that say that women would rather get married and men are the ones who are the issues and they're not they're the ones who don't really you know need encouragement to get married and that's why toastvote says it's actually to encourage men to get married but what how does it encourage men to get married well in other words again this is all thinking that maybe the woman doesn't need to take an oath to get her tuba money back so it makes a lot of sense why rashi says what he said because it's obviously in the best interest of the woman to be more lenient on the woman and then that would encourage her to get married from the gecko when she knows that, oh, it won't be so hard for me to get my tuba money. But Tosa doesn't like that because it goes against all these Gemaras that we saw already. Some of them, we'll see more of them later about women always prefer to get married and it's the men who need the encouragement. So Tosa says, we're talking about the second marriage. A woman gets her ketuba, right? When does she get it? Before she's going to get married again, or at least she's looking to get married again. If she's looking to get married again, what will make her look more attractive? If she has money in hand, that was a more attractive proposition. So, right, it, again, if he knows, it's not even just that the, the husband's after the money, but if he knows the woman has money, he knows that she's not dependent on him for all of her financial needs because she already has this tuba money. So he'll be more likely to marry her. So therefore, we want to make it easy. And then the focus is on, number one, it's the women finding favor in the eyes of the men rather than the reverse. And number two, it's talking about the upcoming marriage and not the, the marriage in the first place. Rashi's saying it's to encourage women to get married in the first place. Let's make their tuba easy for them to get. Husband saying, let's make it easy for them to get their tuba from their first marriage, or it could be their second or their third or whatever it is. But in order to enable them to get remarried, get them their money quickly so they have money in hand, so it'll make it more attractive for the men to marry. It's a very interesting machloka because it comes up over and over and over again every time this mishum china comes up. So now we have to understand why did they stop letting these women take oaths? And what's interesting is the story that we're going to see, we see a bunch of stories of women, okay, for those who, who want to see women in the Talmud and what was 
it like for the woman in the Talmud. Today is your day. We're going to have a whole bunch of stories, some a little disturbing, some a little less. Um, anyway, you're going to get a little insight into some women in the time of the Talmud. So this story is actually the reason why they stopped women from taking oaths was because of some story of some random woman who took an oath. She happened to have been a widow, okay? But I don't think that that's relevant here. She wasn't taking an oath about her ketuba money. So it's very interesting that they wouldn't let women take oaths for their ketuba money because of what this woman did. And, and what we're going to see in this story and in another story later today, how sometimes you have an extreme story and that causes a reaction among the rabbis to change something. Okay, which is very interesting, right? We always talk about change or a bit of change and how it comes about. Sometimes it's a very slow process. And sometimes one incident, you know, as we say in Hebrew, there's a phrase, nafala simon, right? The simon in the old telephones, you know, and then they realize we have to make a change because of, we have to take drastic measures because of this situation. So the first situation is the following. So first, this is introduced by an elema. Elema means if you're going to say this, usually it's rejected. In the end, this won't be rejected but they will raise a question on it. And they're going to say, but if you say that, blah, 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 but we're going to have to wait a while till we get to the end of that phrase. We're kind of going to be in mid phrase for a while. If you say it's this story, then we're going to explain the story. And then we're going to explain some issues of the story. And then we're going to get back to finish the end of that, that kind of phrase. We're kind of mid sentence, but I'll get back to it when we get there. If you're going to say it's Mishum de Rav Kahana, because of what Rav Kahana said, what did he say? Da Amar Rav Kahana and Amre La Amar Rav Yehuda Amar Rav. Some people say Rav Yehuda said in the name of Rav. Maase Ba Adam Echad B'Shnei Batzolim. There was a a drought, and he kid dinar zahav etzal amana. There was this man who gave a dinar zahav, a gold coin, to this widow to watch for him. He mechato bekatsal kemach. She hid it in her flower. Okay, maybe not the smartest place to hide things. But again, people always write, this happens all the time. You think, oh, let me hide things. I used to hide jewelry in pockets of my clothes when I was nervous I would get robbed when I was younger. And then, you know, probably I gave away clothes with jewelry in the pockets, right? Because who can remember where I stuck it? So it's like that. So she stuck it in her flower. What happened? By the way, this is what I always said. I gave away my clothes. It went to someone poor. At least they got some jewelry out of it, right? So here, this is what happened. She baked it in her bread. Her bread, she didn't realize the money was in there. It went to a poor person and the money was gone. So after a while, this guy comes back for his money. And he says, give me my dinar back. Now she says, I don't know where it is, but I swear, right? She swears in the name of her son. She says that the, the samhamada, the drug of death, the elixir of death will come to one of my children. Okay. Otaisha, she's talking about herself in the third person, which often you do if you're going to say the language of a curse. Okay. So the samhamada should come to one of my children. If I benefited at all from your dina. Okay, that's this is her oath. Not exactly in the typical language of an oath, but it is considered an oath here. Amru, and they say that the way the story goes, this is the way you would tell a story, right? The way the story goes, they say, it's like you don't really know if this is true, but this is what they say. And not very many days passed, and one of her sons died. When the rabbis heard this, here you go with their drastic action. If this is what happens to someone who swears truthfully, which we'll get to in a minute, this is a truthful oath, well, hold off. All the more so, someone who lies, who takes an oath falsely. So therefore, they still don't really explain why they're worried about this uh, irregular amana taking an oath falsely about getting her chuba money, but we'll get to that soon. So therefore, they forbade these, or, these uh, widows from taking oaths. My tummy Yancha. So the first question is, why did she get punished? She didn't really benefit. She didn't use the money for something. Well, she sort of did. When you bake bread, right, the loaf is always the same size or you or people pay by the weight, by the size. This dinar took up some size that her dough didn't fill. So in the end, she really did benefit not from the value of the money, but she benefited from the space that the money took up in her in her dough, in her bread. So she did actually benefit. Now she didn't take an oath truthfully. It was a false oath. She thought it was a truthful oath, which is why they say, 
she thought she was swearing truthfully. And therefore, look how much she got punished. All the more so, this is going to happen to us. Now, Kamara now asked the question. It doesn't seem, and this is why I said before, it doesn't seem that the fact she's a widow is relevant here. It just happens to be a story with a widow. But again, it's unclear because this isn't a widow who's collecting her tuba money. So it's a little bit strange. But what they, I think happened here was that the rabbi said, wow, look what could happen. It seems to me possibly they were worried specifically about women saying the following things. Okay, about women kind of in a, in a moment of desperation saying something that, you know, there's also a concern. I mean, the woman's desperate to get her money. She might take a false oath because of that. But we'll see soon why she's really suspected of, of taking a false oath. And I don't think it's specifically because she was a widow. Help. So now the Gemara says, Imi shumha my iria almana, I feel the grusha nami. Well, it shouldn't just be almanot, it should be grushot also, right? Because grushot also, when they go a divorcee who collects her money from the orphans, also needs to take a note. What? We're not worried she's going to lie? Alama, and, and we're not. Because Alama Mara Bizera Marshmallow says, if you're going to say, this is by the way, we're back to the Ilema. If you're going to say it's from this story, and because we see from the story that perhaps women or perhaps, you know, it, it's unclear, really. It's not so clear why the reaction was widows now can't take oaths to get their kachuba money back. But whatever reason they were worried about widows, they should have been worried about divorcees also. Like. And why did Rabbi Zeram or Shmuel, Shanuel and, and Shmuel said clearly that a divorcee can take an oath. So this reaction, if that was the reaction to this woman who took an oath, it should be a reaction across the board. Widows, divorcees, it doesn't matter. The sense is that women, or this is a situation that people would be suspected of lying in. So now they're going to say, no, why is it specifically widows? And now we're going to understand why specifically widows who are collecting their chuba money. It's not all widows. It's widows in the context of this situation are suspect. And that's why if you say, why women, not men, because it's specifically this situation. In other words, that story showed them that women sometimes could take oaths falsely because they believe that what they're saying is the truth. And we're going to see the same thing by this widow. And this is, I'm going to warn you that this next line is a little hard to understand exactly the reality here, but I'll I'll try my best to explain it the way I understand it, but I'm not sure if this is the only way. Because again, it's hard to understand without knowing the reality of, of how things went there. We're worried about, it's called We're worried that they're going to lie because they think it's the truth. means you're going to teach yourself that it's okay what you're, what you're doing. What does that mean? It's possible that she got money already from the ketubah. But what does she think? She says, well, listen, as opposed to, right, rationalize, that's a good word. So she's rationalizing. What is she saying? She said, either, now I'm not sure the reality, either what I told you is the husband already put money aside for her and possibly gave her money when she was still alive for the ketubah. But when he dies, then she's dealing with the orphans. Now the, the divorcee is not really dealing with the orphans because the orphans are in the house of, the husband, right? Let's say also his orphans, his children from other marriages. The divorcee has nothing to do with that, right? So she thinks that, well, I now dealt with his orphans once he died. So the money he gave me, let's say he gave him 50 zoos from the ketubah, that goes to paying my salary, so to speak, for dealing with the orphans. And we, we do this all the time. We justify. We say, oh yeah, that money I took from there, but, but I've, I've spent my time. So maybe that goes to that time and not necessarily for what it wasn't enough. Like we do this all the time, but I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example, but you could see where there's some justification here where she thinks, oh, that money, it wasn't clear to me. It was my ketubah money. I thought it was for something. Else. I thought it was because I was helping deal with his children. I thought it was, okay. And, and therefore she might take an oath and say, I didn't get the ketubah money when really she did, but she just allocated it to something else, which you know, is it really true? Because he really gave it to her as ketubah money. Maybe she's deserving of a salary otherwise, but then she should collect a salary. That's not from the ketubah money. So that's why there's a concern specifically with widows that they're going to lie. And again, lie, but thinking that it's true. We're exactly going to get your question, Becky. Okay, focus on Rav and Shmuel today. We're going to have a lot of them today. Right now, we're going to have a debate about what Rabbi Shmuel said about this. So Rabbi Yehuda says in the name of Rabbi Yirmiyabra Abba, 
The Rav and Shmuel both say, Lo shanu ela bebetim. When we say you can't take an oath, it's only an oath in court. An oath in court was done. Why is an oath so much more serious than an edir? It was done with God's name. It was done usually sometimes also with the Sefer Torah. But Rav and Shmuel both say, according to this version, that outside the court, you actually could have to take an oath. Ini, is this really true? The ha, we're going to have a very interesting statement. Rav lo mag Rav did not allow Amano to collect their tubas at all. Fascinating. You can't collect your tuba. What do you do then? Well, you collect Mizono. Okay, until the point where you can't collect Mizono. And then you're on your own. Okay? He wouldn't allow it. We'll get to it in a minute why he wouldn't allow it. But if he wouldn't allow it, then obviously he doesn't allow a shvua outside of court. Because if you allowed a shvua outside of court, it would be a good, easy way for them to do it. That's the point is that Rav didn't let them take an oath, not in court, not outside of court, and wouldn't let them take a neder either, which we don't know why. But basically, Rav Gamliel says, no oath, yes, neder. Rav went farther, farther and said, not neder either. So, Kasha, this is in fact difficult to what Rav Yehuda said, because it really seems like Rav didn't allow this. Now, Shmuel allows this. Everyone agrees. But Rav, we're going to see, but Surah Manuhachi, and Surah they said, as Rav Yehuda had said. But in the they had a different version, Manuhachi. Now notice the difference. The version in the Hardea was that Rabbi Yehuda said in the name of Shmuel only, not Shmuel Emra. The Shmuel permitted it outside the court. And then their version was, but Rab says, no, you cannot do it outside of court even. And Rab Litame, and in this version, it says Rab is consistent. With what we know otherwise, did Rav lo mag be tuba la merlata? Because Rav does not allow widows co to collect their tuba money, okay? Because they can only collect by taking oaths or neders. He didn't allow oaths. In a second, we're going to see why he didn't allow neder. Billy Adri Billy Why wouldn't he allow a neder? Bishnei de Rav, In his time, people were very lax about vows, they didn't take them seriously at all. In which case, he said, if people don't take their neder seriously, well, that's not going to help. A neder again, what would be a neder? She would say, all the fruits of the world are forbidden to me. Let's say something like that. The Mishnah had said, kol mashi yirtu ayitomim. The yitomim would have to agree on whatever she was forbidding to herself, right? I'll forbid all the fruits in the world upon me if I took money from the ketubah. So now if she doesn't care about a neder, then all she has to do is just, she'll eat fruits and go against her vow, right? The idea is here that if she really took ketubah money, she won't eat fruits. And if she eats fruits, it must be an indicator that she really didn't get her ketubah money. And there's no lying, by the way, it's just breaking your neder. Now, if people don't care about breaking a neder, then, you know, it doesn't really help. So now we're going to have some situations because of this statement of Rav that would not allow widows to get their ketubah. So somebody goes before a Puna, a woman, and she says, he says, look, you want your ketubah, but what can I do? My hands are tied. I'm not going to go against Rav. He was my rabbi. Rav says, I can't give you your tuba, so I can't give you your tuba. You can't take an oath in the court. You can't take an oath out of the court. You can't take an adder, according to Rav, so we're stuck. Amrale, um, so she says to him, Midi Hutama. Now, what you're going to see in these, both these stories is the women knew what they were talking about, which is very interesting. This is why I like these stories. The women were knowledgeable. They understood the opinions. They understood the reasons. She says it right here. Midi Hutama, Ella Dilmanikiti, Midi Miktubati. What? Is, is the reason you're not allowing this is because you're worried I took some of my ketubah money already? Hi, Hashem Tzvaot, I swear in the name of God. She just says, you, what, you're worried that I took money? I swear in the name of God I didn't take any money from my ketubah. He says, well, I can't allow you to take an oath, but you know what? If you already jumped up and took an oath on your own, Rav actually agrees that since you already took this oath, you could collect your money. So she ends up getting her money. Okay, I see, see someone wrote, go to Shmuel. She was even smarter. She just said it right there. And basically she gets her ketubah money. That story has a happy ending. The next story has a much less happy ending. This is one of my all-time favorite stories, even though you might say, why would you think this is your favorite story? It's quite a complicated, difficult, and it, it's a sad story. Um, but it's, I think it shows a lot of interesting things. So this woman comes now in front of Rabbah, the son of Rav Huna. Now, Rav Huna was the one in the previous story, and his rabbi was Rav, and he did the following. So now she comes to get a ketubah. He says to her, 
what can I do for you? And now he adds to what his father had said. He says exactly what his father said. Look, Rav wouldn't allow tubas to be collected by, by widows. And my father wouldn't allow tubas to widows. Now, again, you have to think about Rav before we move on in the story. While it's true that Rav wouldn't allow them to bone, and you think, how could he have been so insensitive to the women? But you remember, you can still get Mizono. So it's not like he left them high and dry. They had monthly food payments. That's what they need. That's their, what is a ketuba anyway? A ketuba is like about a year's worth of living expenses. So they don't need that if they're continuing, right? As long as she can continue to get her Mizono, she's okay. So it's not as terrible as it sounds. But let's see what happens in this story. Amrale, Havli Mizone. So she says, well, then give me Mizono. Amarla, Mizone Nami Leila. Oh, you can't get Mizono anymore. Why? Da'ama Rav Yehuda Amav Shmuel. He now quotes a halacha of Shmuel. Someone who comes to the court to claim her ketuba money no longer gets Mizono. So now he really made her stuck. Okay, this woman now can't get her ketuba money because she can't take an oath according to Rav, where Shmuel would have allowed her to take an oath. And she can't get her Mizono because of something Shmuel said, whereas Rav would have allowed her to get Mizono. So that's what you say, she's bald from both sides, right? She basically gets nothing. So Amrale, she said to them out of total desperation, she's very upset because now he's basically leaving her on the street. And this is really showing a lack of sensitivity entirely to her situation. Turn over his chair, which is a curse, basically saying this man should be killed. Because he gave me the chumras of both sides, right? He basically made me stuck because he held like Rav on this issue and Shmuel on that issue. And that is totally unfair. So first of all, again, what do you see? She knew her stuff. She understood that Shmuel would have allowed her. And she understood that, that, um, Rav would have allowed her Mizono. Now, if she really knew her stuff, she might have been smart enough not to go to Rav Barhuna, Rav, 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 the son of Rav Huna's baiting. But obviously, she didn't know he was going to do this. And maybe she didn't realize that he was going to go with Rav. Maybe she thought he would go with Shmuel. Anyway, she gets very angry at him. She gives him this big curse. Hapua le corse sua. They turned over his chair physically, okay, thinking that maybe they could fulfill the curse in that way. And then he won't die. But it didn't work. And in the end, he never got out of his weakness. Basically, it sounds like she caused his death because she said what she said. Okay, very crazy story. Extreme, as we say. Um, you see a woman who, in total desperation, and I always say about the, you know, it always reminds me of that story of the woman who they built the sukkah with her beam and they wouldn't give her, right? They, they wouldn't give her the beam back, right? And she's very upset about it. Um, and it was all these rabbis that were sitting in the sukkah with her stolen beam and she starts screaming. And you know, these women are, are in a state of desperation because here this woman is really being left on the street. She has no income whatsoever and she's very frustrated and she has no other means but to, to curse. That's all that's that's left at her disposal. And it's it's very hard to see. Um, and even a woman here, she seems like she was knowledgeable and understood but she understood enough to, to really criticize them. And that's what's important because the next line in the Gemara is very significant because in the end, she gets the job done. Maybe not for herself, but for other people. Because Amar le Rabbi Yehuda le Rabbi Yirmiya Bira'ah, Rabbi Yehuda then says to Rabbi Yirmiya Bira'ah, it's not clear if this happened immediately after this episode, but it's very likely. He says to him, Adra bebeitim chutz I will take a neder in court or uh, shvua outside of the court. Um, just one second. No, I guess, right. She, let her take a neder in the court or uh, a neder in the court or a shvua outside the court. The late kala the lipo baodne. I'm going to make a big thing about this, a big PR campaign about this. Okay. And the, it should fall on the ears of everybody. Because this needs action to be done. Okay. What does Rashi say? Kishmuel Rabbi. He basically says, I'm making a campaign that we pass on like Shmuel against Rav. First of all, you have to think that is a huge deal. Rav Yudah, first of all, was a student of Rav. And to go against Rav publicly is, right, it must have been Rav was no longer alive. There's, I can't imagine he would have done this if Rav was still alive. But he basically says, Lo tzimidi bam shal tamidav shal Rav, Rashi says, 
I'm going on a big campaign against the students of Rav, like Rav Huna Ubeti No, that wouldn't be giving tubas to Alma No. He says, this cannot happen. And he basically makes a public campaign to say, we are not postuling like Rav on this issue. And again, it takes sometimes an extreme case to get people moving on things, right? So change often happens very slowly, but sometimes when you have some extreme situation, like we started with the one about the woman who took this false oath and her, or thought she was taking a true oath and her son died as a result, they said, no more oaths. And then when this happened and this woman caused the death of Rava Barapuna, right? And also ended up on the street, he said, we must make uh, a change in the system. Which is very interesting to see. Now they asked another question, getting off to more mundane things. So the Gemara goes to Gufa, goes back to the statement we said earlier. Amar Rabbi Zeira, Amar Shmuel, lo shanu ela almana, aval grusha mashbiinote. Okay, it's only an almana, but a grusha, we saw already, can take an oath. So now they say, u grusha da adralo. Now, if you can't, can take an oath, then you can't take a vow. The vow was only a takana, right? A vow wouldn't work normally. So it sounds like a divorcee can't take a vow. To which the Gemara asks, really? Not? There was, a, there was a letter that came from Israel that said the following. There was so-and-so, this woman, the daughter of so-and-so. That she got to get from this guy, who was also called Ayamari. This sounds like and and not the words and any name he has, but says exactly his other name. Um, okay, so now she got a get from this guy, so meaning she's a divorcee, and she took a neder, and she forbade all the fruits of the world upon her. That's where I got this idea from. She only got one, I think it's a cloak or something. Okay, she got a sefer tilim, she got a sefer eel, and a book of Mishle that was falling apart. Interesting to think about what the women took out of the marriage, right? This is what she took. Those are the only things she took of his as part of her ketuba money, moving out of Amubet. Vishamnum, and they assessed how much this, and as we as the court assessed the worth of these items. It's Hamishamane, that was the value. And therefore, this letter is being sent to Chutzlaret now, because the woman's coming to a place, you know, let's say it was in Babylonia. That's the husband was living in Babylonia. When she gets to you, get her the rest of the money. So what do you see here? She's getting a get with a neder, a vow. Didn't we say that doesn't work? To which they answer, It was a get of yivamim. What is a get of yivamim? It's a get. Okay, let's talk about yibum. This is a good review of yibum. So we're going to get to a good review of Masechet Nedarim. So Yibum is a husband dies without children. She gets married to the brother, assuming he wants to marry her and do Yibum, but he doesn't give her a ketuba. Her ketuba money is from her previous husband's estate. Now, what happens? Which she doesn't have heirs because, right, the brother inherits him, but it comes from his property. So when, if her Yabam married her, by the way, Rashi gives a different explanation of this, but I'm going to go with Toso, which to me made more sense, but Rashi also gives another explanation you could read there. But the get Yabamim is she married the Yabam, and then he divorces her down the road, which he can do. And when he divorces her, she gets the ketubah from the original husband's estate, which is widow, status of widow, because she's getting it as a widow, not as a divorcee. So that's one possibility. Um, okay, by the way, I meant to mention something else. It reminded me, I forgot to mention this. When we talked about a grusha getting her money without taking an oath, right, that she can take an oath. We're talking about a divorcee taking an oath about the orphans right? For the orphans. So why is a divorcee collecting money from orphans? Or why would a divorcee need to take an oath at all? A divorcee is getting the money straight from the husband. The husband's there. There's no, right? There's no reason why she would need to take an oath at all. I forgot to talk about this. This just reminded me. But the idea here is that a divorcee can, there's a whole bunch of situations. There's at least five where a divorcee might need to take an oath. I'll give you two of the examples. One is, let's say the husband claims I gave you the money back already. So then if they have an argument about it, and he says, I gave you the money. And she says, no, she would need to take an oath. Okay. And, and there we're not worried that she's going to lie falsely. Or the more simple example is she got divorced and then the husband died before she took her tuba money. So now she's collecting it from his orphan. Okay. Also this case, I agree with your question, Gita, which is even this gate, if I mean, there are no orphans. 
but still it's similar. What's the issue with the orphans? That let's say she's taking it from the orphans now. And what happens to the property? The property goes to the brother, who's the Abam, and then it goes to his sons. So now she's collecting from his sons, who first of all are now orphans, right? And they're, it's money that's really theirs now. So there are orphans, number one. And number two, it's also a situation where nobody really knows what the original husband did, whether, again, it's someone who's gone, who's not here, and therefore we need to take an oath of that. Next situation. Now we're going to get to the neger and all the questions about the neger. And like I said, this is going to be like a sugya of Masech and Nidalim. Hitkin, Rabbi, if you remember, the whole end of Masech and Nidalim was all about Hafarat Nidalim, the, the husband being able to nullify his wife's vows. And also we talked about Hatarat Nidalim, what's the differences between them when a Chacham is not here, the neder. So we're going to see all sorts of laws about Nidalim. Vows. Right? So she makes a vow based on what the Yatomim say. We want a vow about this. Forbid this upon yourself. They agree upon it. And then she takes a vow, says, this will be forbidden upon me if I took tuba money. Rafuna says very simply, it's only if she's not married. Let's say she got divorced. Uh, let's say the husband died. She got remarried. So she certainly isn't getting the zone of anymore. But she still is, her tuba money is her tuba money. She can still collect it when she's married to somebody else. She can't get food anymore, but she could get her ketubah money. So he says, no can do. You can't do a neder at this point um, if she wasn't married, um, if she was married. Aval niseit emidirinota. But if he married her, then no way, no how. Why? Niseit my taima, the mefer labal. So now they say, right, it's obvious. What's the problem? If she takes a vow and collects her ketubah money based on it, her husband will hear and he'll just nullify the vow. And she could do a whole, right? Her and her husband could do a conspiracy here. She'll say, look, I'll take a vow. You get rid of it. And perfect. I'll get the money in between and we'll have a lot of money. So because of that, you can't. But now they say, wait, the whole reason is because Mefer Laba, right? Kiloni say Nami. If she's not married, she still can't do this vow. Why? Because when she gets married, her husband can just nullify it, right? So she can take a vow now. In a month, get married, have her husband nullify the vow. Why can't she do this? You might remember. Ain habal made for bakotin. The husband can only nullify vows she takes when she's married to him. So that's why it works. So basically, Rafuna explains, if she's not married, she could do it because the husband can't nullify. If she is married, she can't because the husband can nullify. Okay, that resolves the husband. But it doesn't resolve she could go to a chacham and undo the vow. Rafuna must hold that when you go to a chacham to undo your vow, you have to say what vow you're undoing. This is a machlok that we're going to see at the end of today's step. You have to say, I took a vow about the following thing, and then the chacham decides, will I undo it or not? Now, if you don't specify the vow, then there's a problem, because then he might undo this kind of a vow. But if you specify the vow, he'll hear what the vow was. He'll understand that you took your tuba money based on this vow, and he'll say, no, can do. I'm not undoing this vow. Rav Nachman, Amar, Rav Nachman disagrees with Rav Puna about the marriage part and says, even if she's married, to which they say, how could you possibly say that? And he said, this is interesting, for sure her husband's going to, right? This is assuming the husband's a no good Nick and he's going to help her out here and support her in lying. But anyway, I think what it means is for sure there's a possibility, not for sure the husband will do it. Not every husband's not going to do that. But because he would have to be dishonest, but for sure there's a possibility that made for Labal. So they answer, now we have a solution to that. Let's make it a kind of vow. Now, this must have been the kind of vow that a husband can't undo. What is that? That he, this kind of vow has to be taken to the, for the orphans to get her money in public. And a public vow can't be undone by the husband. Okay, there's certain vows that can, there's certain vows that can't, Things that are done in public, which is probably 10 people, although I, I forget if there's a machloket about this, I forgot to look this up, but it's done probably in front of 10 people. The, hus you can't, the husband can't nullify that kind of event. Now they're going to a question on Rav Huna, the first opinion. First opinion, remember, was only if she's not married. If she's married, you can't do it. Nisei metive says in a bright Nisei kovak tubata im nadra. If she's married, she gets her tuba if she took a vow. Now, it sounds like, or if she takes a vow, let's read it like that. My love, Nadra Hasha, it sounds like if she takes a vow now. Lo, din Nadra Meikar. No, it's past tense, more the way I said it. If she took a vow before she got married, then she could still collect her tuba. Let's say she took the vow. In the meantime, she got married before she managed to take her tuba money. Then she can still collect her tuba money when she's married. 
as long as she took the nadir before. And in that way, the source doesn't contradict Rapuna. Again, you could read the source as contradicting Rapuna, which is if she's married, she could get her to, but if she takes a vow now. But Rapuna would have to read it if she took a vow in the past. Now they say another bright though that goes against Rapuna, which is Bahatanya Niset. No deret with go back to batat. Says if she's married, she can take a vow and collect her money. Now this is very clearly against Rapuna. Sounds like she could take the vow even when she's married. Tanaihi, to which they answer, it must be a machloka tanaim, and Rapuna sides on one side, and this bright sides on the other. De ikalamanda amar, and how do we know this is a machloka tanaim? Because ikalamanda amar neder shu dar be rabim yesh lo hapara. The ikalamanda amar en lo hapara. Because there's a whole machloka. If, before we said, if you take a nedra in public, the husband can't nullify it. But that's actually a source of debate. And that's the root of the debate between Rav Huna and Rav, uh, Rav Nachman. Because if you say a nedra that was taken in public can't be nullified by her husband, then we have a way to take this nedra even when you're married. If you say a nedra that was done in public can be nullified by the husband, then we have no way to do it. And that would be Rav Huna. Now we ask another question. Ibailu. Going back to something we saw before, we saw that the reason why we're not worried about a chacham, that she could go to a chacham to undo her vow, which is usually a way that people can always go to a chacham and ask to undo the vow again. You don't always agree, but there's a machloka now, we buy them. They ask the following question. Do you have to or do you not have to? Rav Nachman Nachman says you actually don't need to explain. You don't have to go when you go to, to be made for a neder. You go to the Chacham, you say, I have a vow, I really feel bad, I took it, and the Chacham can undo your vow without you specifying the details of this particular vow. Rav Papa Amar, sorry, Rav Papa says, of course you have to. Now we're going to see the root of their debate. Rav Nachman Amar, I know it's sorry. This is very, very interesting, and it connects with things we saw already in this Masechet. It comes up a few times in this Masechet. Amar Tzarich, if you say you have to, Zimnin de is Leila Dibuwe. Sometimes people don't say the whole story. We've seen this also in stories all the time, that they only find out the details later. Like they say something and then they find out, oh, it turns out we just had this, right? It turns out she was only betrothed and not married, or it turns out this. There's all sorts of things, but also we saw in the beginning of the Masechet, I remember, I can't remember, but we, um, why didn't, according to Rabba, who says it's Lishma, why don't we say, B'fanai neftav Lishma, B'fanai neftav Lishma, we're worried we're going to cut something off. We might cut off the important part. So don't have it short so that, you know, so here, the same thing because we're worried people will not say everything. What will happen? Chacham my deshama mefer. The chacham is only going to undo the part of the vow that he heard. So if I say I took a vow about the following and I explained the details, but I left out some details, he's only going to undo the part that I told him. But I'm going to think that the entire vow is undone, and then I'm going to go against my vow, which is obviously seen as a very serious, grave thing. So therefore, better not to specify because if you specify and you don't say everything. By the way, if you know, in Hatarat and Darim, when we do it on Erev Rosh Hashanah, or well, some people do it on Yom Kippur, it says there, and I can't even detail all of them. Like, my Darim were great, and I can't even detail all of them. It's kind of giving a bit of a, you know, and I know there's things here that I'm not specifying, and I want you to undo those as well. Tanan, now they ask a question. Uh, sorry, Rapapa Amart Sarich, Mishum Miltadi Sura. He says, no, you have to specify your nether. Why? Because maybe you'll have something that's forbidden to you that you forbade. Let's say you say, I mean, this would be weird. I'm giving an extreme example, but um, you say, I, I take an oath not to eat pork, okay? Now, if a chacham undoes that for you, you say, listen, I took a really uh, an oath. I feel bad. I took it. Can you undo it? And you don't realize that eating pork is forbidden by Torah law. Now, maybe that's Torah law. It's a bit extreme to think that you wouldn't know that. But you can think of an example that you wouldn't realize that it's also forbidden by the Torah, and then the Chacham will permit it, and he'll actually be permitting you to do something that's actually prohibited. Or our case is a perfect example. She took an oath in order to collect the money, and now she wants to undo it. Uh, um, not an oath, a vow. Now she wants to undo it, right? And that would be a sword. This would basically be allowing her to steal money. So this kind of, if you don't specify the vow, then you could have a situation where the Chacham will undo this vow that he should not have undone under any circumstances. So we're going to end with a question now. It's not. It says in the Mishnah. If you are a Kohen, you're not allowed to work in the temple if you marry, let's say, a divorcee. So a Kohen marries a divorcee. He can't work in the temple until he takes a vow to forbid 
benefit to him. If you remember, we saw this at the chibot. If you take a vow that you won't benefit from your wife at all, you have to divorce her. So the next step is divorce. But if he wants, because he already took the vow, which means he's going to definitely divorce her, Tane Allah, there's a bright time that says, what does he do? No dare. He can take the nedra immediately. Oved, he can go to the temple and work based on the vow. Yored, he can leave the temple. Umagavesh, and divorce her only after. He, he can actually work without having divorced her because he took this vow. Now, if you say you don't have to specify the vow, Dilma he could, he could go to a chacham. The chacham can undo his vow after. And it turns out he worked in the temple when he was actually married to this woman, right? It's the fact that he already took this vow, that is if he divorced her. But why? He could theoretically go to a chacham. So this seems to go against the opinion that you don't have to specify the neder. You don't have to specify the neder. He has a way out and the neder shouldn't be that valid. Okay, so what did we see today? We started with this topic of the Almana. We thought, why well, maybe there would be a reason why we would think she didn't have to take us a vow at all. That's why the Mishnah had to tell us she does. But then we don't allow her to, I'm sorry, uh, an oath. Then we don't allow her to take an oath because of the story of the widow with the, with the gold coin. And then we said, well, then no women should be believed, even a divorcee who has to collect money from orphans. And then we said, no, the Almana is in a unique situation where we think she's going to kind of think that her tuba money was really for something else, for taking care of the children, and therefore she might actually take a false oath, not really realizing it was a false oath. Then we had this machlok at Rabbi Shmuel, or was it a machlok at Rabbi Shmuel about whether you could take an oath outside of the court? We ended up really saying that Shmuel says yes. Rav, we really seem to think, says no. And then we see, because it fits with Rav, that he wouldn't let Almano widows collect their tuba because he wouldn't allow vows, uh, oaths, and he wouldn't allow vows either because people didn't take vows seriously. Then we have the two stories, the woman who got up and took the oath on her own and we let her. And then we have the woman who basically couldn't get anything because he ruled like Rav on this issue and Shmuel on a different issue. And then we had um, a, a divorcee. It seems to be she can actually take a vow, but no, they said it was really more of a case of a widow. She was collecting it with her widow hat on. She was both a widow and a divorcee. And then we had this whole debate about Rav Kuna and Rav Nachman is it when she's not married only, or is it also when she's married? And that affected, how is this nedr done? Was it done in public? Is a nedr done in public? Can he vanillify? Can he not vanillify? That's a whole debate. Does she have to specify the nedr? Are we worried a chacham can undo it? Well, not if we say she has to specify the nedr. No chacham will undo that nedr. And then we got into a whole question about what the machloket is, about why people say, yes, specify the nedr, or no, you don't have to specify the nedr when you undo your vow. With that, we'll finish for today. I'm going to finish up a little more of this tomorrow and then get to the other takano of Eidim Chutmim Al-Ashtar and we're going to start proofs well tomorrow. Wishing everybody a great day and a Kodesh Shalom.